your body loses 10 billion cells a minute. Your whole body is replaced every 365 days. So those 50 trillion cells need what I call healthy proteins to be produced to stay healthy and to uh, stay away from uh, dying of what I call disease and prematurely. We're really designed to last 100 years. And by the way, who wants to uh, live to be 100 and look like a dried up prune? That's not longevity. So longevity means that your body is not producing cheap proteins. When your body produces cheap proteins, you're, ha you're going to get disease because it's not replenishing it, the cellular structure in the correct format needed for you to age gracefully. Welcome to the Menopause Mastery Podcast, a show for women just like you who are ready for more health, vitality, passion, living life with a purpose. I created this show because I knew that women just like me in this second season of life, the season of menopause, are really tapping into their deepest desires. And we're ready to harness our physical and mental health and explore what our true passions are and peel back the layers to uncover exactly what we want out of life. I'm your host, Betty Murray, part geek, part magician, and your new medical bestie with a dash of sass. I love taking the complex science and making it easier to integrate into daily life. So let's join the journey to make this season the best ever. Welcome back to Menopause Masteries. So today I'm talking to Natasha Trednev, and she is known as the mother of probiotics. Quite literally, she was the first person to actually introduce the category in dietary supplements in 1980. And she comes from a long line, a long line of, of family members that cultured food has a deep understanding, not only of that history, but she has been the leader in the, in the study of probiotics, your healthy micro, uh, microbiome, microbiota. And she has led lectures around the world, including Canada, Mexico, Australia, Singapore, Belgium, Amsterdam, and England. And what we went into today is, is really a deep understanding of what are safe probiotics, what are some of the subterfuge and, and lies in the probiotic industry, and also a little bit about the concern of new probiotic strains and other things that maybe haven't really been researched. You know, I always say that a good microbiome, uh, microbiome and good microbes are microbes with good fences and we make good neighbors when everybody stays in their lane. And so we really get into that and really dig through some of the misinformation that's out there. We talk a little bit about our immune health and how our microbiota play a role in that, mental health, longevity, and all the different things that are, the microbiome plays a role even in digestion. So join me now as I talk to Natasha about probiotics and your health. Well, Natasha, I'm excited about this conversation. I think most of my listeners know that I'm very much into the microbiome. That was a big part of my PhD research. And, you know, I think we're only skimming the surface, but I believe you have so much more to say about it because of your 54 year history in this arena. So let's talk. Mm -hmm. How'd you get into probiotics, the microbiome? What brought you there? Well, um, you know, my family has been in the yogurt and cultured a dairy product uh, field for 750 years. My father uh, is and was Macedonian, and um, he we, he actually brought the concept of natural Bulgarian style yogurt to North America. And when I graduated from UCLA, he just says, look, I need your help. I had a different plan in life, but he said, my English is poor, and this is such an important uh, topic that I literally started with no business uh, two yogurt products, one liquid acidophilus, and I had to figure out the market. They didn't have any refrigerators. Do a tremendous educational program that took me years. And then I figured out, I said, my God, if we could control which microorganisms we get into the body and at what level, we can literally eradicate disease. And I don't say that, uh, you know, with uh, without, I say that really without reservations. That's what I mean, because I found that church groups were coming 
to my father's little factory in Glendale. Uh, they were buying things uh, by the case. I was absolutely amazed. And they just told me the miraculous recovery they had from many problems. And since then, unfortunately for all of us, the environment has gotten much worse and the problem is much more serious and severe. So that's why I felt I had to do my research. I was um, given the um, exclusive license for the University of Nebraska to represent their findings in the field of um, beneficial bacteria, which I later called probiotics, and uh, what their impact was on human health. And so that started really my whole career in the late 1970s, going back into this field and really uh, figuring out what it is that we need to do to take it to the next level. And believe it or not, for 20 years, people begged me to take the probiotic category off my label that it was confusing consumers. Hmm. That seems strange. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, because, well, because don't forget, nobody knew what I was talking about. True. And I went around the United States, lectured. I was interviewed on TV, uh, radio. I flew to uh, Australia. I spent three days in the Guadalajara Medical School lecturing to them. I went to Canada. I went to Great Britain. I went to Holland. So wherever people wanted me, that's where I went to lecture. Wow. You know, it's interesting. So you and I were talking before we got on and there's, you know, there's a, you know, so you were the, you were really the mother of this entire category of nutritional mm -hmm. supplementation, but now it's kind of been co-opted into this almost drug-like category. Talk about that because it's, it's not that simple. <clears throat> No, yes, um, it's been co-opted into a, what, I, what, I, what I call is a quick fix symptom, or now it's even put into candy. And that's so absurd, and it's so bad for the population because uh, the manufacturers will give us what they want, what you want. They're not going to spend time educating and telling you what's good for you. They're going to give you the perception of reality you want. Whether or not it's good for you or not is beside the point. And... You know, I studied um, microbiota, probiotics, or beneficial bacteria for decades. And actually, I got a hold of the Microbiome uh, Trust in 2012 and 2013 when they're actually establishing the category. And again, no one knew what anybody was talking about. So just now for clarity, you know, microbiome actually meant, I think people use it in different ways now, but it's the sum total of all the genes of the 100 trillion bacteria that line your GI tract. And microbiota are actually the 100 trillion microbes that are in your GI tract and real, literally every part of your body so that we are a hybrid of microbes and human cells. And understanding what this impact is of these two categories is really we can change our life, our longevity, our ability to think, to function, and we don't have to die of, you know, what I call the de debilitating disease. We can really change everything around. The idea that one single strain is going to be the end all be all for a particular <laughs> condition is just uh, crazy making. Now, so so let's talk specifically about immune function, right? Because obviously, sure. our, mi our microbiome and biota have an extraordinary impact, if not complete control of our immune system. So let's talk about your understanding of that and help my listeners understand how important right. they are. Well, if you think about um, your intestinal tract as a crazy place where everybody's trying to park somewhere, and that's the you know visual you have. It, there's The microbes are trying to park somewhere, and when they're trying to park, they're either trying to fool the immune system or they're trying to cooperate with the immune system for their own selfish needs. So now, uh, depending on whose numbers you look at, between 70 to 80% of all your immune function and cells occurs on that uh, 27 feet of GI tract. And if you took the small intestine and spread it out, it would cover a tennis court. So now if you can think of a Star Wars scenario where these microbes are sending out uh, photon light emission to communicate with the immune cells on your intestinal wall, either telling them that they both have, have to bolster to protect the intestinal wall because there's an 
undesirable element in the group or to calm down that it's only food passing your intestinal barrier to nourish your body. I mean, basically that's what it is. And they can communicate on various levels with the immune system. And as well, the pathogenic bacteria can fool the immune system and do something that's detrimental to the body, which is the basis of all autoimmune disease. It's so absolutely. I put it in a very simple, you know, form of what that means and why people give names, you know, um, medical people give names to autoimmune disease, but basically it's a pooling of the immune cells to attack some cellular structure in the body besides the attacker. Exactly. Exactly. So so let's so let's dig in just a little bit deeper. So when we're talking about immune function and the microbiome and and all of the different little bugs we have, there's this idea that okay, if we put let's say soil-based organisms, I'd love to know your opinion on that. Let's put some soil-based organisms in there and then everything's going to automatically and I've read a lot of the research. I've spent a lot of time but you know if we put soil based organisms in there they're going to automatically sort of remodel the gut and make it better what do you think about that as, uh, as somebody that's been in the this field horrific tragic lie that's ever been told to people and give me give you a simple example uh you know when hopefully when you were growing up your mother told you to wash your apples you wash your fruits to wash your vegetables why it was to get the dirt off. But when you got the dirt off, you also got the soil organisms off. And they're in, in the GI tract that in minute amounts, and you don't want them to come out in there at any large numbers because they will and can use toxin production to clean up the territory. And also uh, they're what we call a pleomorphic organism, meaning they're shape shifters. They can change from uh, a spore, which is a way that they hibernate and protect themselves from the environment and never really open up to do anything in the GI tract, but leave your body via your um, feces and up to 40% of your fecal matter is uh, bacteria. So they can, uh, you know, bacteria are very smart. They're always operating in their own best interest, but the problem comes in when they become be, decide to stop sporulating and become a regular bacteria. And now they're trying to clean up the territory. And this is not well searched and found in the literature, but they can and will produce toxins that will harm your body and will trigger uh, the, the immune, not just the immune cells to go crazy, but for your genes to be switched on and off, which is not a good thing. And so people don't know the ramifications. I've been battling with the FDA because I went to several seminars in 210 and talked to the FDA. And basically they think if somebody else is using it in another country that it's okay. And I go, no, it doesn't matter that they're using it. You just don't know enough and you can't take that chance. We've been raised on pretty much processed food here for the last 40 years. And we don't have the capacity to deal with these or, uh, microorganisms, especially in large numbers. No, that's so true. You know, our diversity and richness of our microbiome in the U.S. As somebody that does a lot of stool testing, just, you know, trying to understand what's going on, particularly the digestive function markers. And we just, we don't. Our jungle is very, very sparse with very few animals. So much yeah. so. Yeah. And the whole thing about the people thinking they're creating diversity by buying these multi-strain probiotics, it's uh, its an illusion. You know, it's it just so wrong uh, biologically, microbiologically, and it's such a tactic for people to sell you thousands of labels made from the same base manufacturers, but just, how shall I say, massaging the message a little bit to get you into their camp. That's true. So let's talk a little bit. So we, we obviously discussed autoimmunity. And so for everybody that's listening, it's your microbes control your immune system. And depending Absolutely. on what's happening there, we could, you know, we could have a very good relationship. We're symbiotic. Our fence is intact. We like each other, but we're good because the fence is intact. Now, it can play a role in a bunch of other things. And I, I would argue that you know, our microbiome has a lot more to do with our other health aspects like mental health. 
Mm-hmm. Um, talk about that because I don't think people, and obviously that doesn't do a great job of selling pharmaceuticals, right? If we understand that our microbes no. are, are handling that. Let's talk about mental health and your microbes. Yeah, well, you know, that's a topic for maybe a half day seminar. And I do, in the past, I have give, given continuing medical education lectures. But basically, um, you have a separate uh, nervous system called the enteric nervous system. And that is completely separate of the parasympathetic and the regular nervous system. And there's something we call the vagus nerve that takes information or neurotransmitters from the gut to the first brain. And that uh, communication is very important because your thoughts can create bad chemicals <clears throat> excuse me, to be formed inside your GI tract, which then make a hostile environment for the beneficial bacteria, which are necessary to produce serotonin. Up to 90% of your serotonin is produced in your gut. And about 50% of your dopamine, which is another feel-good chemical, is produced in your gut. And the precursors to make tryptophan and GABA are also made in your gut. <clears throat> so that regulatory measure is very important because if you're having what I call bad thoughts, depressed thoughts, anxious thoughts, that will cause a disruption in the gut. So not only should you uh, restore your mental thoughts, like maybe good meditation and practice, but you should also be feeding your body with the right probiotic bacteria, with the delivery system that will deliver them alive, because you're trying to establish that um, optimal balance of those bacteria so that the bad chemicals either produced by the unfriendly bacteria or by your thoughts is mitigated and you can return to that healthy state. So it was a sort of a short explanation. <laughs> no, that no, but you're right. You're right. So, so you touched on this. You talked about the right delivery system live back live the live bacteria let's talk about that because again this is a nice you know subterfuge in the industry that people might be getting stuff that has nothing in there yeah well but the thing is uh, that bacteria don't perform for us because they like us or because we're telling them that they should perform you have to meet their criteria by growing them in a food that they like what the human being needs but what they like to stimulate them to produce the things they need to survive and thrive because their primary objective in their life is to dominate their territory and to grow their own kind, period. And they're very single-mindedly controlling that. So <clears throat> first of all, when you put a lot of microorganisms together in a capsule, they're not dormant because dormancy happens at minus 170 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like liquid nitrogen. So anything in between we call arrested growth phases. So how do you arrest the growth? By lowering the temperature. You lower the temperature for your food so that it doesn't get spoiled because higher temperatures cause the bacteria to grow, right? So the way you protect your food is by lowering the temperature And that's how you uh, protect your uh, probiotic bacteria by lowering the temperature and not stimulating them to grow. So when you put the bacteria in a capsule, now remember, in order to meet their manufacturing criteria, they strip that bacteria of their growth medium. So they're like the little naked cells. They concentrate them, freeze dry them, and then they take these freeze dried powders and they mix them all together in one capsule And most bacteria do not like each other because the normal state in microbiology is called mutual antagonism. So mutual antagonism means that they're going to be nasty to each other, especially if they're crowded and allowed to touch themselves in the capsule. So they will be fighting for food. They will be fighting for dominance. So the ones that survive are not gonna be very healthy. They're gonna be drained. And when they reach the stomach acid, they're going to have very little chance for survival because now they've had to use all their energy to survive in a capsule that's probably in a plastic bottle and a lot of of moisture to seep in. 
uh, temperature changes that causes that moisture to seep in even more, they're awake and they're trying to grow from a zero microbe to trillions within hours. And they're now dying off rapidly in that capsule. And maybe one or two species will survive because we call them the survivors, but they're not gonna waste their cellular energy once they get inside your body to do anything else. And basically that's what's wrong with you know 90% of the capsules that are on the market, whether they tell you to refrigerate them in a plastic bottle or even in a glass bottle, but they crowd all these microorganisms and allow them to touch each other. And plus, uh, as the author of the probiotic labeling standard read into congressional record, when you put an organism in the bottle, you have to say how much of that organism you can expect to have when the expiry date comes to maturity on that bottle and on that label. So unless those things happen, you have no idea what you're buying, what survived, or if anything survived when you ingest it. So that's for everybody to listen to. That is so very important, you know, because you might be spending a ton of money on supplements that may not be valuable. And even other things like yogurt products, you know, you've come from a long line of family members yeah. providing dairy. You know, people buy yogurt products thinking that there's probiotics left in there. No, actually, I set the um, liquid st uh, yogurt standard in California in 1969. And basically, dairy products, had a st they still have a standard, but it's not really enforced. The starter culture of a product that is fermented defines it and gives it its name. So in other words, in North America or in the, in the EU, and especially in the Balkan states, unless the two bacteria, which are called uh, Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Streptococcus thermophilus, one of the few symbiotic bacteria and all of microbiology are uh, put into yogurt fresh and healthy to ferment the milk, not just to sour the milk, but to actually ferment it. You're gonna have an inferior yogurt. And unfortunately, there's not enough of these positive microbes because of the wet nature of yogurt and the fact that they don't survive because they're gonna start growing rapidly and start dying. And frankly, is not enough in our culture that's been really imploded with 209 chemicals in uh, processed foods, chemicals in the air, chemicals in the water, uh, toxins everywhere and pesticides. So unfortunately, uh, real fermented foods, and I'm not even gonna talk about them that don't match their label declaration, uh, do you no good because uh, you don't have no idea what's in there or what's actually caused the uh, product to be become fermented. It's become sort of a, a wild ride. When, you, when I look at the fermented foods and somebody will slap in a kefir sample label, somebody will call something a yogurt, somebody will tell you to ferment your vegetables at home. And I literally stay up at night worrying about those people who have no concept of sanitation in the kitchen and I know, I don't know, even know what they're growing in those so-called fermented vegetables that somebody told them is real easy to grow in their kitchen and, and to facilitate. So uh, we need to get back in enforcing definition of the names of what I call functional foods, which is the fermented foods like yogurt or kefir. By the way, I assisted New York State in setting the first kefir standard in the United States, which is then adopted by other states across the nation. So without standards, you have no idea who's selling you what or what's actually in the product. Goodness. So can you, because you touched on something and I, I'm actually curious, can you explain the difference between truly fermented and souring? Because I think people think if it tastes sour, then it must be a probiotic. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, fermented foods, you actually have bacteria and you stimulate them to now digest. That's what fermentation is, to digest the product or pre-digest it for you. And while pre-digesting it for you imparts uh, what I call beneficial metabolic byproducts that not only benefit them, but benefit you. And souring the milk is just putting something sour that will, you know, sour 
the milk or get some process of breaking down uh, the molecular structure of that substance, but not necessarily providing you all the beneficial metabolic byproducts and giving you live bacteria along with those metabolic byproducts. Thank you for that. Thank you. So I want to touch on this because, um, you know, I, I, I would say everybody wants to live healthier and he live healthier longer. <coughs> so longevity has become kind of maybe not necessarily a new buzzword, but that's definitely kind of where everybody's brain is going right now. How does our, our microbiome and the health of our gut really play into longevity, aging? Well, I'm going to give you a simple answer to another complex issue that I should spend an hour explaining. You know, your body loses 10 billion cells a minute. Your whole body is replaced every 365 days. So those 50 trillion cells need what I call healthy proteins to be produced to stay healthy and to uh, stay away from uh, dying of what I call disease and prematurely. We're really designed to last 100 years. And by the way, who wants to uh, live to be 100 and look like a dried up prune? That's not longevity. So longevity means that your body is not producing cheap proteins. When your body produces cheap proteins, you're, ha you're going to get disease because it's not replenishing it, the cellular structure in the correct format needed for you to age gracefully and to provide all of the uh, cells in a healthy fashion. And that's one part of aging when your body doesn't uh, produce or replicate sufficient number of uh, bo body cells, I should call them, or human cells, uh, to replenish everything. That's why you start shrinking. That's why you have bone loss. That's because your hormones not not recycled, because you don't have the good microbiome. And everything starts imploding because now you're not nourishing the body. You may be just feeding the body. So what people need to really understand about that, it's not necessarily just about the quality of the protein in your food, <laughs> that our, our microbes play a considerable role in that digestive process that actually helps us make the appropriate proteins to regenerate cellular function. Yeah, correct. And not only that, what worries me is all these antacids that we use to mitigate acid production in the stomach, which is the only place your proteins can get digested except there's one bacteria that I include in my formulation that actually will pre-digest the food for itself and therefore help you pre-digest the food for yourself. Tell me about you know, that strain. I'm not familiar with Yeah, it's with called that. Lactobacillus bulgaricus. Okay. I'm one of the few people in the world to pr produce that in a true probiotic product because A, it's extremely difficult to grow, B, extremely difficult to stabilize, but C, uh, was found in natural Bulgarian style yogurt. That's what it's called, Lactobacillus bulgaricus. And to be shown by the early re researcher, Dr. Ilya Mechnikov, to be the cause of longevity of the long lived Bulgarian people in the Balkans. And he said it was very simple for him how to prolong life is to use the bacteria to get rid of toxins in your body. Okay. And that was his whole premise of longevity. Wow. Well, so tell me, tell me a little bit about your products because it's obviously very different than the other brands that are available on the market. Mm -hmm. Not only the strains, but how you, how you produce them, how they're packaged. Right. Well, you know, as I said, I've been in this field 54 years. And one thing I learned about the bacteria that we have to be certain that they're completely safe and that they've been in the literature and in the cultures for decades if not centuries, okay? Don't want to fool around with bacteria because they can and will turn against you if it uh, suits their needs. So the three strains of bacteria I chose was that they have been in the literature for at least 100 years. They've been used by various populations successfully with no injury and no uh, un un unhealthy side effects. Let's use that word. So it's very difficult because... I didn't choose the bacteria that was the easiest to grow, that would survive the best commercially, that would be the easiest to sell because I could uh, 
treat a symptom with those bacteria. No, I chose bacteria that evolved with us, that have been with us for decades, if not centuries, and that have cooperated to maintain the health of the human being on a very provable basis. So that's why I chose three bacteria to put in a special growth medium and a special delivery system that not or are they nourished, but they provide specific help for the small intestine, for the large intestine, for the transient flora. And I was the first in North America to introduce what I call the baby bacteria, which some now sell, but they don't understand another <laughs> very difficult bacteria to grow and stabilize in order to give you beneficial effects. And that's found in healthy babies and it can be used by sensitive individuals uh, of all ages. And that's why I've only used those four bacteria in various products and in various combinations, in various growth media, mediums and delivery systems to give every person a chance to customize an intake formula that is best for their suited needs and their health goals. That's great. That's great. So I want to I want to leave on just a really good kind of overall general note. How would you describe what a healthy microbiome really really means? What what would people need to walk away from this conversation to really understand? Well, and a healthy microbiome means that it's supporting your immune system and it's not by trying to create diversity by ingesting a lot of bacteria. Actually, the three bacteria I chose not only multiply your gastrointestinal tract, do the functions they're supposed to do, but stimulate other bacteria that are necessary for that diversity to make that microbiome healthy. And that healthy microbiome, if it has to be maintained daily like a garden. You don't maintain a healthy microbiome, you're not gonna stay healthy because why? Your tube, which I call is your GI tract, which is your opening to the outside world inside of your body is designed to take things from the outside, make sure that it's compatible with the body and that all the components are digested appropriately and absorbed appropriately so that your body is nourished every second of the day and that the toxic matter is expelled from the body before it has a chance to be reabsorbed in the body. And that's the, that's the recipe for longevity, for health, and for, I got mental stability and happiness. It really is the foundation of health for the 21st century because we've done plenty in North America to destroy that because now only 7% of the mothers can pass on this vital baby bacteria, which is called Bifidobacterium infantis, to their child even if they're vaginally delivered and breastfed. And that's a catastrophe. Wow. And nobody really talks about it. And, and this is what, because there's so many commercial ideas being thrown at you and take this one because it's gonna stop your baby's colic. Take this one because it's gonna make your baby grow. No, this beneficial bacteria starts you. That's why I call it life start because it's there to start the life right because this bacteria does two incredible things, stimulates the baby's immunity while teaching the immune cells tolerance when food comes across the intestinal wall so that you don't have allergies. It doesn't re uh, create you know, overactivity of the immune system, which leads to trouble as we all know. It's so important and we've ignored this and the people selling some of this are making such horrible statements that we really have to understand what this bacteria is, why it's so important to give it to our child, because childhood disease is now become really the national epidemic. You know, uh, if you're if our country is spending four point three trillion dollars on health, and eighty percent of that is spent on chronic disease and mostly in our children, I would say that's the real epidemic. I would agree with you. I would completely agree with you. So 
you know, I start, sort of go into a more holistic explanation because it's not easy to explain why you have to stay within certain parameters. You have to control your desire just to make money, but really sell things that are going to benefit people. And yes, it's hard work, hard work to educate people who have sort of been brainwashed to believe marketing messages and the people who want to tell them what they want to hear. No, absolutely. And, you know, so I, you know, I didn't know that about that particular strain. I didn't realize that the ability to, to really trans transfer that to the infant has dropped to those levels that would, you know, looking at it. And of course we can't, we can't say for sure, but let's look at what's happened over the last 50 years. We have an mm -hmm. extraordinary uptick in asthma, ATP, allergy, food sensitivities, autoimmune, over 50 million Americans are expected mm -hmm. to have that. Like, obviously this is part of that education of the immune system that when it's not been correctly done, you have an immune system that can't distinguish self from other. Yeah, correctly. And, no, and don't forget, I saw this in the European journals, the warnings appearing as early as 1970. And nobody even knew what I was talking about. Uh, and even in the 80s, what? What's this bifidobacteria? What do you mean infantis? Wow. And, and even doctors, I used to go to pediatricians and talk to them about it. It was, they, it would just, you know, slide off their forehead. <laughs> I, you know, it's not that they were not educated or they were knowledgeable, but nobody ever explained it to them. No. Well, you know, and we don't have, you know, your company doesn't employ, you know, a thousand drug reps to go to the office, bring lunch and give a rundown because it's, it's impossible to do that. Pharmaceutical companies are the only ones that have kind of deep pockets like that. And that's where decisions are made. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the tragedy is that everybody, every doctor is uh, uh, mandated to treat uh, a symptom, to treat something in the body without understanding. And when I would explain to them, I was attacked for telling doctors early on that there's nothing sterile in the body. Oh, they said the blood is sterile. You can't get things past the blood brain barrier. Oh, I was almost thrown out of a few <laughs> lectures. People got so angry at me and I said, that's okay. You know, time will tell. Uh, there's no, there are no uh, bacteria in your brain cells. Uh, there are no bacteria in your womb. Uh, the uh, um, umbilical cord is sterile, the baby's Intestines are still, I said, no, 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 absolutely not. Wherever you find any nook and cranny in the body, you'll find bacteria. Absolutely no sterile place. Just because you can't culture them doesn't mean that they're not there. Exactly. And that's how they found out we have bacteria in the blood. They actually, somebody had the phenomenal idea of taking a sample and putting it under a microscope and saying, oh, wow. Look at all those species of bacteria in the blood. Yeah. And then there's, you know, there's individuals doing things like that and then telling people that those bacteria shouldn't be there. Yeah. Well, we don't know yet which bacteria should be there because okay. actually it's the bacteria that cause plaque formation, not your mm -hmm. cholesterol. Right. And I got taken to the carpet for that one too. Yeah. Uh, because cholesterol is really the only food your brain can take. And maybe that's part of the explosion of all the mental problems we see. So there's a lot to talk about here. You know, it is, uh, you know, that's why I'm still working. I should have sold our business uh, many years ago, but our employees and people knowing me, please, uh, you can't go. This is too important for our children and the chronically ill children we have. And I am involved in uh, successful autism programs I am even reached out to the addiction clinics because I told them that without fixing the gut, you're going to have a lesser chance of getting those people back to normal unless you cure the gut as well, because the microbes become addicted, just like your cellular structure. But it's a hard thing for them to understand. But once one clinic, at least let me give it to their two patients within a month, the patients felt tremendously better. They were able to digest. They had a better mood. They felt better about themselves. And actually, 
the owner of that clinic could not believe what he was hearing. And you know, that took me almost a year to get that clinic to accept just to, for me to give it to two patients. Oh, it's so frustrating. It's like, <laughs> feels like yeah. an uphill battle sometimes, doesn't it, Natasha? It is, it is. But you know, it's like, you know what? And I think the, the ladies and the women and the mothers <clears throat> in our society can change that. We're the nurturers and we have to become informed. We have to know what we're buying. This is not about making more money or selling you something. This is about a real true understanding uh, you know, the health movement started about 70 years ago, and it was done by passionate people who risked everything, including their their lives, their possessions, to overcome the obstacles to get this word out. And in the old days, the people who ran companies knew intimately everything about the product that they were selling and stood behind it and didn't have, you know, 50 extensions in their line and telling you that they're all the expert of making 50 different products and they know what they're selling you. That's not true. Anybody that tells you that from somebody who's been in this industry a long time, not telling you the truth. Who is your technical supervisor? Who is the actual formulator? And I'm sorry to say this, but formulation is not taught in medical school. So when they tell me it's doctor formulator, I laugh because I said, you know, how, how many of those doctors can even cook? Right. Well, especially I can tell you in nutrition, just nutritional science isn't even part of medical school. Biochemistry is an afterthought. So I wouldn't necessarily say doctor formulated when you don't have that kind of background is helpful. Absolutely. And it's not to knock any of the doctors, but I think we have to put things in perspective. And really as a culture, we have to look, stop looking for that magic cure because the body is complex. Uh, it's a mind body um, community that needs to have the function optimally together and in unity to create that state of health that we want and that we need. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm so glad you said, you know, it's the mothers and it's the reason why I really started this podcast is I felt this calling as I moved into menopause time period. I was like, we need to harness the power of women. And especially I, I feel women in this eight, when we get to this time period, there's this um, extraordinary shift, I think, that occurs where it's like we feel like we need to have a legacy and that legacy could be taking care of our grandkids or it could yeah. be could be coming out and making sure that the world's a better place after we are gone. But I feel like we need to harness our intellectual property and our passion and help sort of change the world. We're in need Absolutely. of some feminine health. And you know, um, and you know, menopause is a very prickly topic, but all I can tell you is that in order to recycle your hormones, uh, you need to have a good microbiome and microbiota presence because what happens is we age we start producing less hormones, but we also start losing more hormones because they're not effectively recycled. So it's a double whammy. And you don't have to have those things. If you start to uh, start taking care of your body, uh, you're not gonna have it. And women hate me when I tell them that I really didn't go through menopause, really didn't have those symptoms. I wasn't jumping naked on my desk. I'm <laughs> sorry. My friends will call me up, oh, I'm burning up. and. They come into a room and they say, it's got to be set at 66 degrees. I can't take it. And I said, my God, this is not normal. And I think we've been sold this deal that you have to go through these and some women have it worse than others. I think if you start taking care of your body and your thoughts, maybe you don't have to go through this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm like you. I never had a hot flash. Oh. You know, I caught it on lab work. I was like, well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and they're yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think it's also a mindset. I think as women, we have to come back to the old days where we were a community and we shared these ideas, shared these thoughts. And not only were we better equipped to nurture ourselves, we were better equipped to nurture our families, which is so important in these days. Absolutely. Absolutely. So where can my listeners find you, find your products? I think that's very important. Sure. Um, you can go to our website, natron.com. And believe it or not, I still have live people 
that you can call into and they'll talk to you and they're not going to try and push you and sell you something. They're there to give you the education and based on your education and need, then you will buy something. So if you still want to talk to a live person and most of them are women, I've got one lady that's been with me for 23 years and she says, when you retire, that's when I retire. So you can call 866, the number four, and the word natron spells N-A-T-R-E-N. And we do give you, help you customize a program based on your needs. And believe me, it'll probably be the best decision you made because so far I've been doing this for 40 years. I have no complaints. I don't even have complaints with the Better Business Bureau, but we stand behind our product. We know it's going to work because we have the largest retention rate of our customers ever seen in this industry. And that's why I'm here. I want to make sure that the mothers get better, the fathers get better, the children get better, and that the whole family gets better. And we learn really true nourishing habits. And by the way, I, I'm going to say something that's not popular. You know, we do have a lot of processed foods, especially for vegans in the industry. And I said, a processed food is anything that doesn't appear in its natural state. So I tell women, if you want to become a vegan, you better sign up for a good course in Indian cooking, because that's the only society I know that's figured out how to nourish the body in a vegan lifestyle without depriving the body of essential nutrients that we need. I'd agree with that. I spent a summer in India back in 06. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, yeah, it's, you can't, there's just so much junk on the market, particularly in your meat substitute f food environment and just processed foods in general. Yeah. And just, you know, to tell women, you know, almond milk, I hate to tell you guys, there's not, there's no things that you can just press an almond and make milk. <laughs> it's a processed food. So is coconut milk. So is oat milk. So, I mean, as long as you're aware of that, I'm not saying bad or good things about it. I'm just telling you it's a processed food. That's it. You make your own decision. Uh, it, it makes it so simple because you think you know what you're intaking, but you really don't. A lot of the young people, and one thing I want to leave you with, please go to the website because I talk about this. Please, please stay away from those juice bars. It gives me a nightmare. It's, when I see those people going into those juice bars, because if you are an old industry member, you know that anytime you break down a vegetable or a fruit, trillions of bacteria start attacking it from the air. And those machines technically should be taken apart every 45 minutes to an hour and sanitized, and then you can use it again. But those machines run, run by uh, young people who probably don't, weren't taught basic sanitation at home, they run for eight or nine hours. I don't even know what kind of cleanup goes on at night, but that food becomes so toxic because of the microbial load in those uh, juices. I don't care if they're green juices, protein powders, whatever you're taking, those machines are not clean. They cannot be clean unless you take them apart every hour. Period. Wow. Well, and not to mention the loss of your fiber and cellulose and all the nutrients that's necessary to feed your microbiome. You're basically that's turning right. into the closest thing to sugar. So That's right. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we've adopted. We've told ourselves it's healthy because it's easy. And I said, no, unless you're doing your own juicing at home and you break down that machine no more than an hour, preferably 45 minutes, you put the juice in glass jars you put them in the refrigerator and don't keep them there for more than 48, 72 hours max. And that's it. And it, then it becomes, yeah, a real problem for you to do that because that is work to do every day. Yeah. I don't juice. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> I'd rather just eat the food in its natural form. Yeah, I, I agree healthier. with you. But I'm just telling people who have been told that they need to juice, you have to adopt these sanitary habits. Uh, and that's not another topic for another day, but, um, you know, the uh, antibiotic resistant organisms that are in our community, 
and on your steering wheel, in the counter, anywhere you touch is really a frightening topic. And that's another reason I tell people, no, 40 years ago, we probably didn't need to take the correct probiotic microorganisms every day, but now we do because we've brought this environment to such a state, nobody else. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for all of that. You have educated my listeners about probiotics and the microbiome and how we need to really, really, you know, take a better look at all of this. And we'll have uh, your, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, and so please, if I can leave you with your listeners with one thing, uh, if you're the caretaker of yourself or your family or a loved ones, you are the one that has to be educated because without that proper education, it can't be passed down. And we're gonna see the chronicity of disease to keep exploding to the point where it will kill our society. And you know, right now, just one example, we're in autism, one in 30, okay? One in 30. And when I started years ago, it used to be one in 10,000. And by 2030, we keep going at this rate. It's gonna be one in two. It'll be a disaster for our society because any parent who deals with an autistic child and they're heroes, believe me, I will not be able to do anything else because our children will be sick and will be chronically ill. And we need to do something now. We got to stop with the hype. We got to stop with everybody that looks sexy and half naked in a TikTok commercial and telling you, you got to drink this magic elixir. We just got to stop it, you know, especially with our young people. And I mean, I'm pleading with all of you to learn, uh, regardless if you want to uh, patronize my products or not, learn and get this learning to the next generation. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I will. That's a mic drop, everybody. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pay attention to. And we'll make sure in our show notes that have how to connect with you and how to follow up for more in connection to your products. I want to thank you so much for being on Menopause Mastery. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And, and God bless all your listeners. And let's make it a better world. You know, we can. We absolutely, absolutely have the uh, possibility and the desire to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Menopause Mastery Podcast. You are why I'm here and I am so very grateful. Hit subscribe so you don't miss any wisdom on creating the most exceptional life on our terms. If this episode has helped you in any way, please share it with a friend to spread the love and together we rise. You can follow me on social media at Betty Murray PhD and you can reach me online at BettyMurray.com. 